Hello and welcome to Meet the Heads, a virtual event. Um, today we are talking about pathways to medicine. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit before we start about um, you cats and how to get into medicine and how important it is. Now, Everything's Education is launching its UCAT Academy. And UCAT is a five section aptitude test needed for medical school entry in the UK. And it needs immense training. Maximum grade is 900 and unis have cutoff points. So our program will work on timekeeping London universities weigh on this terribly and with the lack of work experience due to COVID this year and last year, UCAT will be very, very important. So if you're interested in, in more about Pathways to Medicine, keep stay tuned and listen to us as we talk and also get in touch with us at hello at everythingseducation.com. That's hello at everythingseducation.com. Tonight, um, we've got a full range of people coming to speak to us, but I want to introduce my wing woman from the evening, my co-host, and she is the headmistress at Badminton School, and she is called Rebecca. Rebecca, are you there? Hi, I am. Thanks for inviting me. Hi, Rebecca. How are you? I love your necklace. Thank you. Just a bit of fun to help the day go through. I know it has been a very long and interesting year, hasn't it? Very, very long. Yeah, that's my face usually when people ask me, how's your day? <laughs> yeah, but I think we're at an exciting time now. It feels like we're moving forward. So it's great to be having um, an event like this where we can think about future options for people. Absolutely. I mean, I think in the past year, everything's just been at a standstill. Do I think about a new school? Do I sit still? Do I think about options? Do I sit still? I think that in spite of the fact that we've had a very turbulent year, it's important for us still to plan because then at least we can put plans to the side, but at least we've planned, you know. So tell us a little bit about badminton and, and how badminton helps with the pathway to medicine. Tell us. And I know oh, I'm an avid, an avid fan of female um, heads of schools. So go ahead and tell us. Thanks. Well, here we are in sunny Bristol. I'm in my study at badminton school. And in my biased opinion, obviously, it's a great place to be. I've been here nine years now, and I absolutely love it. And that's because it is just an amazing community of individuals. Um, we are quite a small school. We're only around 500. So we really know everybody. And I think that's one of our real strengths, because as we learn together, because we know each other, we can really be prepared to push the limits of our understanding, take risks, because we're so confident and comfortable with each other and with this environment. The way of learning here is really about being practical, getting hands on. It's not just learning in the classroom, it's learning everywhere, every day. And so things like science, the practicals never stop. We have research clubs, we have outreach clubs where um, girls from as young as 15 go into local primary schools, to women's institutes, all sorts of things to show um, exciting demonstrations about explosions, about cold physics. And I think it's this way of practical engagement that we have, not just in science, um, even in modern languages. If, if you're a linguist and you love it, you know, we'll encourage you to put on a play, uh, a, a play in that language. Not all of us can understand it. I watched a whole Lorca play last year in Spanish by um, uh, girls sort of in the, in the upper years, but they put um, titles above it so I could work out what was going on, which was fantastic. So I think getting involved with the subjects in a really practical way really helps the young people understand what that subject means. It's not just gathering the information and reproducing it. They're using it. They're trying it out. They understand what that feels like and what that could feel like for their future if they enjoy spending time doing that. And so here, that is the way we learn. And a happy byproduct of that is some really great results at the end of the day and some strong future pathways. And one of those pathways is medicine with about 10 to 15 percent of the upper six every year going on to study medicine at a range of medical schools. And so, of course, over the years, we've developed a really good way of supporting them with their applications from really early stages, lower down the school, just getting strongly embedded science skills, getting them to understand about the empathy of working with people, the level of commitment and compassion through our sort of charitable and volunteering work and pulling all those strands together as they get older and working more closely on things like you just mentioned, Elaine, um, like the UCAT, like the BMAT. 
because even though these are aptitude tests which supposedly can't be taught for, I think we do know that with um, modelling and demonstration and practice, um, students really develop in them. Alongside that, we're encouraging students all the time to explore the professions, get involved, ex explore what happens for a nurse, for a physiotherapist, what happens in a hospital, what happens in a GP surgery. So have a whole range of experiences so they can compare and contrast and see what medicine could mean to them. And alongside that, some, some really um, intriguing things en route. So we run an operating theatre live for the whole of um, year 10, which is a company that will come in and set up a, a sort of fake operating theatre in your school and, and show them what it would be like uh, in an operating theatre, right through to Dissection Club, which dissects everything from flowers through to, you know, eyeballs and all the other things that um, we hear about in biology labs uh, going on. But giving people's time to get these practical skills, manipulative skills, and make sure they understand what it's like to have that dexterity um, and to have the responsibility for trying to get an outcome to identify what they're dealing with, not just have fun, but really take respect for that object and be able to identify it. So there's no one thing that we do at badminton that prepares young people for a future pathway. But what we do do is just open lots of doors, lots of opportunities, give them a sense to explore, time to try things out in, in a group of people that they know well, that they feel comfortable with. And that, that does is really enable them to have the confidence to say, yeah, I'm quite enjoying this. I want to try a bit more or actually be bold enough to say, do you know what? I tried it. And whilst I've always said that I want to, to be an artist, be a doctor, be an engineer, I've tried it and actually it didn't feel like what I thought it felt like and I'm going to try something new. And I think that's what's so important, giving young people that platform, that opportunity to experience what their future could be like and make really informed choices. So I hope that gives you a bit of a flavour of what we're feeling like here at Badminton. And all I can say is the two big words are community and practical experience. Definitely, definitely, definitely. And we're going to talk more about community and practical experience as the show goes on. And I would like to introduce Michael Gray, who is the, the um, head elect for Hereford Cathedral. Good evening. Hi, Len. Lovely to be here and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Michael. I'm just going to introduce everybody and then you can come in and we will have a chat. Mary Maguire at St. John's College. Hi, Mary. And I do believe you're bringing on um, a student who's on their way to medical school with you as well. Thomas, hi. Yeah. How are you? Thank, thank you. Good. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you for the invitation. Good, good, good. Can I just ask that when you're not speaking, put yourself on mute just so we don't get any feedback. Alistair Brownlow from Rochester College. Great to have you here as well. Hi, Elaine. Thank you. Hi, everyone. No problem. And then last but not least, uh, one of our favourites who is a regular on this show, Lansing College. But today we have Andrew Chappell, who's the deputy head. Hi, Elaine. It's lovely to talk to you. And thanks for inviting me along. Thank you so much. So we're going to have a little chat about Pathways to Medicine. And as you know, our community, I mean, on my father's side, I think everybody is a doctor you know it's just the way it should be everybody is a doctor which is why i decided to be a dentist but as you can see right now i am no longer a dentist but i <laughs> i just decided that you know we have to go the family way as it were which is what most most of us do in our communities so tell me a little bit i know you're incoming into hereford cathedral but i know michael you really really want to shake things up a little bit at Hereford. So tell us about Hereford and what the plans are, especially in terms of pathways to medicine. Thank you so much. And certainly I'm really excited about the prospect of taking on the headship of Hereford Cathedral School. The school is in a great place and we're, there's a real momentum that's happening. And we're really excited about the things that are going to take place in the future. I'm looking forward to sharing a little bit about that. And there's so many wonderful things about Hereford Cathedral School. And I believe it's one of this country's great co-educational day and boarding schools. And every year we deliver really strong academic exam results, which are so important, both at GCSE and at A-level. And our students go on to some of the country's best universities, including Oxford and Cambridge, of course. But we're talking about pathways into medicine this evening and we've got a great track record at Hereford in terms of getting students into the best medical schools 
in the country. And every year we have so many students applying for medicine, veterinary medicine or dentistry and so many great successes. And this is particularly impressive when one thinks about the fact that at Hereford there are small year groups, only around 70 or 80 students in a year. And this means, of course, smaller class sizes. And it enables us to deliver sector leading pastoral care, which ensures that every girl and every boy thrives within the school community. But also there's an incredible breadth of opportunity at the school. I think that's so important as well, ranging from debating club to dance club, from Mandarin through to 3D printing. There really is a quite a range. But looking forward, I'd say there's really two things that are, are points of, of great focus as we look towards the future. And the first of those is vision. And I want to share a little bit about that uh, this evening, just briefly, if I may. We're about to embark on Vision 2030, a really ambitious project. You can read more about it on the school website to ensure that every girl and every boy is real world ready. They're equipped to thrive in a rapidly changing world. They've got the aptitudes and the dispositions that they need in a competitive marketplace. These are extraordinary times that we're living in, and we all know something about that. And they've shown to us, haven't they, the importance of agility, resilience, harnessing technolo technological innovation, even as we're doing uh, tonight. Our online educational provision has been exceptional. If you haven't seen our recent video on that on YouTube, then, then do have a look. But embedding digital literacy is something that's vitally important and remains essential for preparing students for life. But not just the vision, it's also about the values, isn't it? And as a cathedral school, the cathedral sits at the heart of our physical environment, uh, but the Christian faith sits at the heart of our values. Well, what does that mean in practice? Well, it means that we care deeply about what our students achieve and who they become as individuals. And that resonates uh, very closely, doesn't it, with the ideas of going into medicine, this great uh, profession of care. Will our students make a positive a contribution for good in society? These are important values that they, we hold to. Will they demonstrate service and compassion? Yes, we're in the business of great exam results. Yes, great opportunities, but also delivering character education. And we're talking about medicine this evening. My wife is an NHS doctor, and the pandemic has shown to us, hasn't it, those great heroes of the NHS, the doctors, the nurses, the administrators, the cleaners, are so many who've demonstrated leadership, courage, and service. And I know that so many former students of Hereford Cathedral School have been on the front line as key NHS workers, living out the vision and values of our school. And our vision is to be the best school in the world, and our values to be the best school for the world which resonate very closely with our theme this evening on Pathways into Medicine. Well, thank you so much, Michael. We will tap more into the diversity of medical applications. Um, Bex, I think you can take the next two introductions. Fantastic. Well, it's great to be here and great to welcome fellow heads. So I would really like to welcome Alistair, who's joining us from Rochester College. And Alistair, um, I know that you've got bags of energy to bring to this this evening. So tell us more. You're on mute. We we were warned that was going to happen, weren't we? And uh, thanks, Bex. Thanks, everyone. Um, just following up, actually, um, on what my colleague was saying, um, at the height of um, lockdown last year, I had an email from a former parent, um, and she said, Dear Alistair, I wonder if you remember Connor, who left RIC six years ago for Newcastle Medical School, thanks in no doubt small part to the amazing teaching at RIC. He graduated this year. He intercalculated it for a year to do a master's in public health and is working in a newly created junior doctor role to respond to the COVID situation. I thought you might like to see the attach to see what he's up to. He's at the front on the right. And she sent me a photo that I know Connor, from having taught him English, won't be happy that his mum has sent me um, of him in the COVID um, front line, um, which, which was lovely. Um, I've been at Rochester um, since 1997. And I do all of the student um, admissions interviews and meet many of our students for the first time. And 
kind of I want to be a doctor is probably the thing I hear um, the most from prospective students, both um, UK students, 75% of our students at Rochester are British, and also from international students. And 25% of our students come from around 30 different countries. Um, one of the things that we try and do at Rochester is offer a very specialist, a very focused medical program for our A-level students um, because it, it's almost like doing an extra A-level actually preparing for medical school um, and, and you have to be, students have to be incredibly committed and, and incredibly strategic. Um, I meet an awful lot of um, very good prospective students who when I ask them why they want to be a doctor they always tell me it's because they want to help people um, but when you dig into that a little bit and um, and suggest well why don't they do something else that involves helping people um, they, they know a little bit less um, I meet international students who want to apply to UK medical schools who don't know anything about the NHS that their applications are, are, are quite unlikely to be successful. Um, one of the things that we try and do at RIC, um, and we're a specialist sixth form college focused on university entry, is very much help our students strategize their medical school applications. Um, it's partly linked to what Elaine was talking about at the, at the top of the event, um, helping them with UCAT preparation, with BMAT preparation, but it's about really um, thinking carefully about all of the aspects to a medical school application, the importance of work experience, the importance of choosing medical schools wisely. Um, my experience is that most students spend more time on their personal statements than they spend actually looking at medical school admissions requirements. UK medical schools have actually got a very wide and varied um, application process and different universities weight different aspects of the application in different ways. They weight the GCSE results in different ways. Some don't even look at personal statements until very late in the process. Um, the best advice I, I think we can all give students who are looking at medical schools is that there are no bad UK medical schools. All UK medical schools are inspected and accredited by the same organisations. And what students need to do really is to think carefully, not just about the teaching style at medical schools that is going to suit them, but also about how their profile matches the admissions requirements to those medical schools. For many of the international students who I meet, and it's harder for international students to gain admission to UK medical schools. There are quotas, there is limited number of places. They have to be even more careful about where they apply based on um, their backgrounds and, um, and their experiences. There are very few students for whom an application to Imperial, UCL, Kings and St. George's are a sensible four choices. And if students want to be a doctor, they should be looking beyond the traditional medical schools and actually being quite strategic. There are lots of new medical schools opening up in the UK that are actually very good choices for students if they're committed to being a doctor. Um, so I think um, one of the things we try and do at Rochester, and I know my colleagues at other schools will be will do as well, is to try to get students to think really widely, to take a, a almost a research-led approach to their medical school preparation and strategize in a way that means that they're best placed for success because it's really hard to get in. It's really hard to get offers. We, we see students every year who are very, very strong, who've been rejected from all of the medical schools that they've applied for first time round. So I think making sure that we are advising students to do their research is um, the best thing that I can sort of pass on this evening. Um, last year at Rochester, we had um, a record eight students um, gain UK medical school places, um, which I was really pleased about. Um, and of those eight students, four of them were actually doing their A-levels for the second time round 
they were retaking their A-levels. So mm. one of the things we might want to touch on later is that there are sometimes different and indirect routes to medicine. Um, one of my students this year from Malaysia um, was in the Malaysian system, and he's actually on a one-year A-level course in the sciences, and he's just got offers from two of the Irish university medical schools. So there are different routes, and I think one of the things we can all do as, as heads and UCAS advisors is to make sure our students are really well advised. So hopefully some of that's helpful, Elaine, and we can perhaps touch on some of the th other things I've mentioned later on. Definitely, Alistair. Go ahead, Bex. Thanks so much. Yeah, I was getting excited there, but we have got more people to meet. And I know that our, our next um, head has brought with her one of her successful applicants who's been on that journey that Alistair was just talking about. So I'm really delighted to welcome um, Mary Maguire from St. John's College, and she will introduce her current applicant. Mary, over to you. Lovely. Thank you very much, Bex. Um, well, obviously, I am uh, head of St. John's College, which is in South Sea, uh, near Portsmouth on the South Coast, uh, about 90 minutes away from London. Uh, we are a Christian co-ed boarding school with children from primary age right through to the sixth form. And actually, Thomas has come right the way through with us. Uh, we have a strong community spirit as well, and we really pride ourselves on those positive relationships between all members of our community, uh, the staff, the students, the parents, um, and so that we can all work together to make sure that we get the best possible outcomes for our students. Uh, and that really allows us to help our students be successful in whatever they choose to go on and study uh, post finishing with us at university, or for some of them, it may be an apprenticeship or it may be straight into the world of work. And um, I was really reassured to hear what this is sort of talking about those world ready learners, because that's exactly what we are striving to do. We're striving to make sure that our students have the skills that make that transition to university and on into the workplace really successful. Um, we are really pride on adding value to our students. We're a non-selective school, uh, so we have students with a range of abilities, and it's all about adding value to each individual student um, and giving them lots of opportunities to develop their own talents and skills, to help them embrace challenges, and when things don't get their way, to help them learn how to pick themselves up and carry on. Our ethos is underpinned by the Lasallian principles of our founder, John Baptiste de La Salle. And those principles are the quality education, inclusive community, respect for others, faith in the presence of God, and concern for the poor and social justice. And I think you can all see how those principles align very well with those students that want to pursue a career in medicine. And those are what we want to make sure that our students take away when they move on from us. So this evening, obviously, we've heard lots about uh, how to, and we're hopefully going to hear lots more about how to guide our students to get make the best possible choices to ensure that they're successful with their medicine application. And that's why I've asked Tom to come along and join us this evening, as he's just been through that journey and has now been accepted to read medicine at Bristol University next year. Um, and I thought it would be quite useful for you or for all of us to hear it from a student's perspective, because clearly we know how to support and we know how to guide our students. Um, but it'd be interesting for you to hear what he says from the other side as well. Uh, so I'm going to actually just hand over to Tom and let him tell you a little bit about his journey and how he managed to be successful in his application to uh, medical school. Tom? Uh, thank you very much, Mrs. Maguire, and thank you for having me on this evening. Uh, so as Ms. Maguire said, I'm a current year 13 student and I've just recently applied to medical school and received an offer from my first choice to study at Bristol University next year. As has sort of been said on this conference, um, getting into medical school is a very difficult process. Um, there's a lot of sort of boxes you've got to tick. Uh, I, I would very much like to agree with the fact that it almost is like a fourth A level. But uh, throughout sort of my, my medical uh, development going in towards university, St. John's has provided me with a fantastic base of support. I've been at St. John's uh, since I was in year three, and in all that time I've developed so much as a person uh, and in ways that I never would have expected. 
Uh, St John's obviously provides fantastic academic uh, resources and I'm very lucky to be um, on sort of on track to be getting the grades I need to be getting into. But uh, alongside that, there are a plethora of fantastic uh, extracurricular opportunities also, uh, whether this is through sports, through music, through drama. These really sort of enrich your CV and make you stand out among other students. Uh, because ultimately, when you apply to medical school, you're going to meet a lot of people who've got good grades. And so it's a lot of the extracurricular stuff that is really going to make you stand out. Uh, alongside that, they provide invaluable support in your actual application process, be this through the um, already mentioned uh, UCAT testing, uh, be this through the personal statement, be this through interview practice, be this through helping you with deciding where you want to apply. Uh, St John's is very sort of um, passionate about getting to know every student, getting to know your profile, and again, sort of as has already been mentioned, uh, helping you to apply to the medical school that suits you best, that will um, utilise uh, your profile and that where you will sort of get the best chance at applying into. Uh, I consider myself incredibly lucky to be um, going on to do medicine, which is a career I've been incredibly passionate about going on to do. And I have so much to thank uh, to St John's for all of the help they've given me over the past. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bex, I think you can introduce the last head. Wow, it's all go here tonight. Fantastic. We've heard so much already, but there's more of the story to tell. And so we are delighted to welcome the Deputy Head of Lansing College, Andrew Chapel. Andrew, tell us your part of this medical pathway story and, of course, about Lansing College. It's lovely to talk to you. Thanks very much, Bex. Yes, I've been working here at Lansing College since 2003 as a, a biology teacher for much of that time and housemaster, amongst other things. Um, for those that don't know, Lansing is a boarding school nestled in uh, 550 acres of uh, the beautiful South Downs countryside. So we're about seven miles from Bryson. Really good uh, transport links up to Gatwick Airport. It's very easy to get to, but a stunning sight with perhaps most famous for having the largest school chapel in the world. And you know those kind of Christian principles, of compassion and kindness and thoughtfulness, they kind of radiate out from that building and the, uh, permeate the, the, the community as, as, as well as, as dominating the physical landscape here. And, um, you know, and that perhaps one of the reasons why um, careers connected to things like medicine have always been very popular amongst our students. Um, so a typical up sixth year group here is about 120. I would expect about 10% of them to apply for medicine and directly relate to medical courses each year. And uh, I think the reason for that was many fold, but um, first and foremost, a really rigorous academic uh, preparation that we provide for them. A-level sciences here are really popular. And if you go to the, the science department here, it's absolutely busying and buzzing literally. Um, with excitement and intellectual energy and, uh, and that's not just from the lessons as well there's, there's a whole array of co-curricular uh, support activities and, and clubs and science societies and perhaps preeminence amongst those would be our medic society um, which has been incredibly successful at preparing youngsters for, for medicine in, in the UK over the last 10 years so um, it's a group largely student-led, um, I'm pleased to say, uh, but also directed by, by our staff in the biology department. And they meet on a regular basis, discuss topical issues to do with the NHS. We arrange lectures for them um, with uh, people who are current doctors in the NHS, many of whom are either former students or uh, parents of current students. We've got lots and lots of links through our extensive digital ex-pupil network with those working in the professions. It's quite easy for us to link up with, with people who uh, are active in the NHS at the moment and, and give the youngsters here a really good sense, a detailed sense of what it actually means to be uh, a doctor in, within the NHS. And we set up, uh, say, uh, dinners with uh, those, those people. We have uh, lectures. We have people going out on groups to visit the local teaching hospital. I've even been along to do um, uh, full body dissections with a group of sixth form, uh, full pro section, which is an eye opening experience uh, for them. Um, and then, of course, there's the interview preparation, because, of course, medicine's an interview course. And um, the youngsters need to know their beans when they're, they're being interviewed. 
but also present themselves in the right way. And, and that comes from, I think, uh, careful preparation. Uh, we have um, a kind of arrangement with local schools as well, Eastbourne College and Christ Hospital and Rodine. And we do exchange interview practice with those three schools, which has been a huge, um, I think, a boost to our, the, the confidence of our youngsters. But also just from the general environment in which they are learning here, it's a very rich educational environment over 120 different activities they can choose from and, and not just the usual sporting things but lots of intellectual uh, clubs and societies all of which help develop the youngsters uh, confidence and self-esteem and, and do that what we call character education um, and i think all of that adds together and i think as one of my colleagues said earlier it, it's no one thing that really prepares youngsters really well for medicine it's it's getting lots of little things right um, yeah. and you know, i think um, the, the track record we have of, of getting youngsters through to those courses is evidence that that's going pretty well here at Lansing. that's thank enough for me for now thank you thank you so much andrew and i think all of you have touched on really really um interesting points which i want us to discuss at this round table right now um i think one of the things that was spoken about by alistair was strategy the conversation about strategy um and how much how much do you 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 teach the students about strategy because strategy is something that they'll need whether they get into medicine or they don't get into medicine so how is how does that um work within the curriculum that you provide in each of your schools in terms of medical applications and and what are some of the real conversations that you have with students i think i'm gonna go to bex first it's such a great question because it's one of those fundamental life skills isn't it strategy and i think mm -hmm. what you'll probably find in, in many of our schools certainly in mine is it's something that's just woven in in so many areas right the way through and it starts really with just giving those young people permission to make choice and it can be on really simple things in you know tutor time are we going to support this charity or that charity why would we do it what are the consequences and and you don't realize it but all the time it's just like instilling in them the importance of decision making, the consequences of it. And um, of course, it's really obvious when they come to fundamental shifts in pathway, like the end of year nine, what GCSEs am I going to choose? They can see that really has a big impact on their future. But it's the little things that impact quality of life or, or how they feel about things or how their day shape pans out. And I think that's the really important role of the pastoral care in our schools as well. A lot of this is led, um, certainly at Badminton, but I'm sure in every school, by the form tutors and by the house staff, those conversations that you have, you know, how are things going right now? What's going well? Why is it going well? Do you think what's not going so well? Why is it not going so well? Or, or looking at a report card that tells you that and some comments from teachers and just understanding how to understand yourself, how to understand feedback. And it's the time that we have with young people and pastoral carers to really inform those choices and understand what decision making looks like. That is just one of the brilliant bonuses of this great education that we can offer at our schools. And I think um, young people are really lucky to have that time invested in them. And I know sometimes they may not always feel that at the time because they want to get out of the room and go to the sports club or to go and just be with friends. Um, but actually, um, as you go through that journey, you really begin to value having those people who are there as a sounding board, sometimes a critical friend pushing back at your original ideas. And so I would say that it's it's no one thing. Certainly from my experience here at a boarding school, it's just a great big mesh of the pastoral interaction led by those form tutors and pastoral carers. And of course, we do some things in our schools. We put on big events, you know, resilience days and um, take on the challenge days. And, and those type of big events, people are like, wow, you know, everybody knows what it's about and they can see um, the skills they're putting into use. But those are, are not sustainable. You know, one day brings it to the front of our mind, but it's the every day that really makes a difference and the care system we've got at the school. And I know I feel strongly about that here at Badminton, but I can see nodding. Mary, are you feeling that strongly about St. John's as well? Yes, Bex, there's so much of what you said resonates with what, you know, what we want to do with our students. And I think absolutely is, you know, it's that interwoven into their everyday life. Um, and, and the strategy, you know, also that to have a plan B, it's, you know, that 
I think that's the really important thing as well. It's not just about you know picking a strategy. It's about then also if things aren't going to plan and if the strategy is not working, being able to step back, look at it again and, and think of another way of doing it. And I know Alistair talked about that in terms of the alternative ways into um, medical school and a medical career. But I think that it's all part of that sort of, you know, making sure that if things don't go right, that's OK, because then we can look at another way of doing it. Yeah, definitely. Did anybody want to add something else to the conversation? If I may, I think just to add, I think it's really important that one plays to their strengths and encouraging the students to reflect upon that. And even down to those important decisions around whether you choose the BMAT, the UCAT, those sorts of things. And I think one of the things, certainly in a Hereford context, that we found has, has been really valuable is getting to know each student so well we're three to 18 schools so we've got that that really strong relationship with every individual and our biomedical society can then provide that really bespoke and individualized care to help sorry them michael i'm gonna have to stop you for a second and explain to us what a three to 18 school is of course explain thank you is, yeah absolutely so that's a school whereby the students first can arrive at the age of three and go all the way through the school until the age of 18. So there's that continuity of the curriculum. So we can build on that year on year. And we've got that, that educational and curricular continuity. And also because the students have been with us for such a long period of time, the, the depth and strength of those relationships and the individual knowledge that teachers have really helps them to be able to guide them so they can be strategic in the decision making processes that they take. Thank you, Michael. Now, Alistair, I wanted to speak to you about strategy as well, because sometimes things don't go the way that we want. And I know Rochester College as being a retake, a retake college. That's what I, I knew that sort of school as being. And then there's nothing wrong with retakes as long as you know the strat the things that went wrong initially. And that's what I say to a lot of students. There's nothing wrong with retakes and there's nothing wrong with trying a second time because that's life, isn't it? That's how you learn about things and that's how you gain your resilience, right? Yeah. No, how, I, yeah. how do you manage those expectations when you get a student that comes in the door and thinks that they've been defined by the grades that they've had before? I, I think um, increasingly um, some universities are just very clear that they will not look at A-level retake students. If you don't get those grades first time round, you need to go and do something else. That's changing. There's about a third of the medical schools that in certain circumstances will look at students who are having a second go at their A-levels because they are demonstrating some of the important skills that they will need when they're working in the profession. You know, they're demonstrating tenacity. They're demonstrating that they're committed to this profession as, as a vocation. Um, going back a step, though, in, in, in terms of strategy, we, we do it in quite a structured way at Rochester. We have um, one of our biology teachers is um, rather schizophrenically and um, interestingly also a practicing GP. So he spends half of his time actually practicing as a doctor, the other half um, teaching biology with us and, and running our medical program. That side of things is very structured. But I, I would give a kind of word of warning you can you can over strategize or over systematize um, an application for medical school um, the medical schools don't want robots they don't want students who've been spoon-fed their way to a successful application they want rounded human beings that function in usual ways that can empathize with different people and i don't think we the best way that all of our schools are helping our students prepare for that is by exposing them to all of the extracurricular activities that people do so well, the, the music, the volunteering, the service, all of this just feeds into them being interesting human beings. Some of the difficult conversations I have with students when they haven't got into medical school first time around, it's because actually what they really needed to do was do an A-level in being a human being. The medical right. school the medical schools don't want science geeks. They want people who can actually communicate, who can actually kind of operate. 
yeah, operate outside very narrow stratas of, of, of society. Uh, one of the things that medical schools despair about is the kind of lack of diversity in the applications they get. Mm -hmm. Why are so many applications for medical schools and successful ones coming from a relatively small number of schools? Schools mm -hmm. like our own. Um, how, mm -hmm. how can we help our students actually, actually stand out? I remember having an animated conversation um, with the person who was in charge of medical school admissions for one of the London colleges. And she said to me, and she glared at me, she was very scary. And, um, and she said, Alistair, they're all the same. They've all done Duke of Edinburgh. They all play the flute. They've all done their work experience in hospitals, nepotistically procured. And she said, I'd rather they'd had a job at McDonald's because that way they might actually have met some real people and be, and be prepared for the spectrum of experiences that you actually kind of have to deal with if you're going to be a successful doctor. So yeah. the best way, I, the best advice we can give and the best way we can encourage students to kind of um, be not just successful applicants, but more importantly, successful doctors is actually just to kind of do lots of interesting things and don't over strategize your medical school application. Obviously put some thought into it, but go in there and be yourself, be relaxed. Don't try and give, if you get to the interview stage, don't try and give the answer that your expensively bought medical preparation preparation program has told you they want to hear actually tell them what you think and um, it, it, it's a lot more effective yeah I totally agree which is why none of my children play the flute between them they play seven instruments <laughs> and none of them is the flute, of <laughs> there's nothing wrong with the flute but my children play the viola the piano french horn double bass bassoon and the drums so I made sure they didn't play the flute because I played the flute didn't really help me get into medical school but yes um there is a question that has come up there's two questions actually which I'm going to throw to um the heads the first one I think is to you Thomas and it says that what grades did you need to get to get into Bristol Medical School um, so the grades do sort of depend um, I think in sort of if you apply from some sort of locations or some particular schools then you can sort of get a contextual offer which can be a bit a little bit lower uh, for me the grades I need are AAA um, Wow. I'm currently sort of online to achieve, but um, obviously that is a very high standard. So yeah, I've got to sort of put a lot of effort into making sure that you um you you get the grades that you need there. In terms of GCSEs, uh, I think Bristol sort of does place more of an emphasis on the UCAT, which has already been mentioned. So getting a very high score in that is um, definitely very advised. Um, people say is sort of to aim for a 700 average overall, uh, which is a pretty safe benchmark. Um, and if you've got then you'll sort of um, be putting yourself in a very good position to be very competitive among other applicants. Um, uh, and yeah, I'd say that um, everything's really important there. But yeah, AAA are the grades that uh, I need to get. Thank you. Um, another question that's come up, I just got it via email, is um, we're talking a lot about UK schools. How many schools help with US applications for medicine or to US schools? How many of you do, Bex? I see you on on mic. We we do have a lot of students um, go through the sort of preparation for the US pathway, and we can support them through that. We start talking about it in year nine, really, and start talking to them about you know the the breadth of of the offer and what it means, and and we just raise that awareness. And as they go through, then we give offer for for the testing steps on the way so that they can fit that alongside their studies without having to travel anywhere else and add any complications so it's all part of the deal here but I have to say to date we've never had any of our medics interested in a in a U.S. place that's wow. that's what I've never thought of it's just it's just never come up for us we've never had to pursue it um I would say they they're all firmly UK um based is, is their ambition usually when they're applying from here I don't know if anyone else has got experience yeah. with U.S. medics I 
Yeah, I think, Bex, one of the reasons why we don't see it um, sort of um, demand for American applications is the way that medicine's taught at US universities, which obviously kind of tends to come later rather than being direct entry um, to an mm. undergraduate degree. Um, what we have seen over the, the last few years is particularly from international students, though, interest in European medical schools. And there are some good new medical schools opening. There's a very good one on Cyprus. Um, Queen Mary have a campus on um, yeah. Malta yeah. now. Um, so there are um, emerging options outside of, of the UK. But no, I, I haven't seen um, interest in, in the US from, from UK or international students. Okay, thank you. I hope that answers the parents' question. I'm sure they'll be coming to all of you to find out how they can have the access into the medical school that they want. Now, I, I did want to touch on something before we move, we, before we come to a close and you'll give your closing remarks. Now, we've gone through a really turbulent year with all kinds of things happening in Black Lives Matter. And Alistair, you touched on diversity and I want us to have a conversation about the, the applications in diversity because we have a lot of parents who are going to be watching now and later on um, who are based in Africa, based in the diaspora, based in America, based in Canada, wherever. And, and the conversation of how you can support children from a diverse background with an application, the level of expectation that's placed on them, how do you manage that as a school? And how do you make sure that your level of input or your level of applications is as diverse as you want it to be? I think I'm gonna go to Mary to start with. Sorry, thank you, Elaine. I think it's just, you know, uh, when you have a diverse community within your school anyway, it almost is part of, of what you offer across the board. You know, we have a school which, we're, you know, I think we're, we're relatively small compared to lots of the other schools that are, are here this evening. Um, but within that community, we are represented by 15 different nationalities. And I think it's just because you're not just within the medicine, but across all key, all, all areas that students from every background are encouraged and, and shown that, you know, whatever your background shouldn't be any way of holding you back from what you want to do in the future. So it's that positive encouragement. It's looking at the individual. It's working with the strengths of each individual um, and encouraging them and saying, you can do this and we can help you do this right from the very start. Thank you, Mary Bex. I can see you itching to on my. <laughs> I, I totally endorse what Mary says. It's about starting the conversation where the pupil is. When we have um, international boarding schools like some of ours, we've got people coming with different um, cultural contexts, different um, social lived experiences. And what we need to do is really unpick where they are on that journey, understand it and start the conversation from where they are, not where it says on our program for that year group. And so that's why coming back to that whole point of pastoral care, getting to know the individual, getting to understand them, their context, so that we can then say, right, okay, this is where we need to direct you next so that you can begin to understand what it would look like to go on this journey. And I think, you know, all of our schools have, as, as we've seen with Thomas joining us tonight, you know, pupils that care about the future. And so we have um, senior students and we also have alumni who are really willing to engage in those conversations. And that makes a difference sometimes because they seem much more relatable and connectable than perhaps I might just saying it's possible for these reasons. And so um, it, it comes down to us knowing our pupils and making those connections, I think. Um, it's the best way I can explain it. Thank you, Vic. Does anybody else want to, Michael? Thank you very much. I think one of the key things for me really is ensuring that as a school, as an organization, we have a global outlook. I talked earlier, didn't I, about making sure our students are real world ready. We've got to be mindful that they're going into a very diverse world, they're going into an interconnected world and ensuring that the curriculum, the content, the values that we have reflect that interconnectedness, reflect that global perspective. So I think that's really important. And again, building on what Beck said about knowing each student and having that community of learners together. And certainly in a Hereford context, we have a, a boarding house consisting of students from all across the world. And that adds, adds such a wonderful diversity to the student intake. 
which enables that to be there to be that shared experience around those shared values, but framed within that global outlook. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Andrew? Thank you, Elaine. Yes, and I just echo really what my, my colleagues have said. And I think it's worth everyone just knowing quite how diverse some of these institutions are. I mean, we have 39 different nationalities at, uh, at Nancing, and, um, and that diversity of background um, gives diversity of thought, um, outlook, and is a huge strength, um, I think, of, of institutions like this. Um, that said, you know, we, I think it's important that we also handle um, in, them as individuals rather than types and, and have those high ambitions for each individual. I think that's a real strength of schools like ours as well. Thank you, Andrew. And last but not least, Alistair. Um, yeah, no, I agree with everything my colleagues have, have been saying. We're, we're, all of us who work in international education are in, in such a privileged sort of position because we have this sort of rich, rich resource of kind of kids around us. But it's also, of course, a big responsibility to kind of not take for granted that just because we have kids from many countries that the institutions that we are responsible for are doing everything that we possibly can do to ensure that different routes are made to seem possible and achievable for everybody. And I think um, that the students are often streets ahead of us on these issues and how to do this. And certainly our students at Rochester from different countries are not backwards in coming forwards in telling us if there are things that we can do better or differently whether it's to do with supporting them, whether it's to do with um, activities, whether it's ju just to do with making sure that everybody's voice um, is heard. From a medical perspective, one of the things that I would say is that one of the great resources that we all have as schools is not just UK parents and alumni who are working as practicing doctors and within the NHS, but we've also got this incredible resource of parents who are working in health systems all around the world and that sense of kind of comparative healthcare and how systems work in different countries and one of the things that we've been able to do in our global perspectives course that a lot of our medics take almost as a hobby is actually use the resources of some of our parents who are practicing in different countries around the world so that they can look at different ways in which healthcare is funded different ways in which healthcare is underwritten by kind of philosophy ideas of global equity, aid, debt. Um, we're, we're all in a really good position to use the resources of both our students and our parents, both locally and from around the world. Yeah, thank you so much, Alice. I think it's really important also to, we're talking about pathways to medicine and we've talked about direct entry. All this conversation has been about direct entry. But what if the child is not strong enough? And just in our last five minutes, I want us to talk about that. I know that I tell a lot of students that come to me that you don't have to go directly into medicine. You might decide that you might realize that you're not actually a medic. You know, there, there, there are so many other routes into medicine. I've, I've known people that have gone and done classics and then gone into medicine as a graduate, you know. So Bex, tell me as my co-host, how you manage that kind of, of child and tell them that, you know, you're amazing, but just not medicine right now. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting one. And sometimes, you know, that that's a, a difference from the opinion their family might have as well. So sometimes it's quite a stressful situation. Sometimes everybody in the family is a doctor and they're either not sure they want to do it, they're not sure they're ready for it, or they're maybe not academically at that stage to make that decision yet. And so I think it's about, as we've said earlier, there's many different ways. There's a smorgasbord of choice. So put it out there. Talk about, you know, all the time when we're talking about things, talk about... Um, postgraduate routes into every type of career not just medicine but you know there's not just option a there's option b there's later pathways um, and it's the same as if you're talking about Oxford and Cambridge some people don't get there for an under, undergraduate degree but they get there for their postgraduate you know let's mm -hmm. let's let's look at life in the round let's not obsess mm -hmm. on this one moment it's part of the journey but mm -hmm. I think being really informed and and saying these topics lend themselves perhaps to the next step more easily 
or these these universities, if you do these courses, will give you a guaranteed next step if you hit this grade. So put the cards on the table, tell everybody about them, make sure that your team in school are really informed so they can say, yeah, this is route A, this is short route B, this is slightly longer route B, you know, and, and just make it all uh, absolutely acceptable choice. There is no um, one, two, three positions. It's literally A, B and C. They're just different. That's Thank what I would say. Thank you. Does anybody want to add? I know we've got five minutes. I want to make sure that we get everybody's um, take on this. Does anybody want to add? I can see Alistair smiling. Yeah, I, I yeah. just simply, simply because the, the scenario that, that Bex has spoken about is one that's so familiar to me. Parents who've introduced their children to me as, this is my son, this is my daughter, they are going to be a doctor. And of course, many of them, that's the route they, they follow, but it's not for everybody. I think one of the things that we certainly do is make sure that students are aware of all the medically related courses. The amount of students I've met who say they want to be doctors, but they couldn't tell me what a radiographer does. They couldn't tell me what an audiologist does or an optometrist. They'd oh, be yeah. a fuzzy on pharmacy, but they definitely wanted to be a doctor. So I think showing that there are these range of professional um, courses that they can take that allows them to work within the healthcare profession and actually progress professionally. Um, nowadays, nursing um, at the higher levels, if you go and do a good nursing degree, can lead to salaries that exceed those of junior doctors. So I think it's to do with um, making sure students are offered different pathways and um, not just saying to them well okay go and do biomedical sciences because you might be able to transfer because the the, the odds are there might be a better route for for these students yeah and if all else so you don't have to be a medical doctor you can be a doctor of philosophy <laughs> anybody else want to say chime in before i wrap this up just to add, if I may, I think it's really important that the students keep the options open because so often they have to make these important life changing decisions at a, such a relatively young age. And therefore, by sometimes deferring that decision by by doing a degree in another discipline in the first instance, it just make, keeps the options open, which is vitally important, but, but does enable them then to continue to have a little bit more time to reflect before making that, that final decision. Thank you, Michael. And I can see, Mary, you wanted to just, just quickly, Elaine, because I am conscious of time as well. Um, but I think it's it's absolutely right. It's it's about thinking about, you know, I, I, and we've all been in that position where the child comes with the parent and says, "I'm going to be a doctor," and I think it's that sort of education through that year twelve pre A level before they start the UCAS to help them explore other options. You know, it is so competitive. It is really competitive, and if you want to be successful, you have to be really passionate about it. And actually. For some students, there are other branches of medicine that lend themselves better to their personalities rather than focusing on, I want to be a doctor, and that's it and only that. Yeah, thank you so much. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank each person on the panel today. Um, and I will ask Andrew to give us our closing remarks um, and then Bex, my co-host, and then I will close us all out. Andrew, is there anything you want to add to the conversation to close us all up? What would you say to parents out there who need reassurance that they definitely want their child to be a doctor, but after listening to this program, they're having a different alignment of thoughts? To talk to their child really in detail and, 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 and see what their ambitions are, because they need to remember that medicine is very much a vocation. It has to be a calling in it. Um, they need a, a long-term persistent interest in this, um, as well as, of course, the right academic interests and support along the way. Um, yeah. But um, you know, don't put any limits on what they can achieve. Thank you so much. Michael, did you want to chime in anything before Bex does? No, thank you. Just other than just to say, I think you know, this has been really informative and and just to, to focus on that individual and bespoke care to meet the needs of each individual, I think, is is one of the key take home messages. Thank you so much. Bex. Thanks very much. Well, I was just, you know, reflecting what everyone said and really building on from from what Michael just started there. All of us clearly know our students, our pupils, and that's what really matters because we need to know where they are and what they want and what they can do. And we need to teach them to know themselves 
so that they can understand the choices, understand what it means for them and understand what they're going to enjoy for their future, which is what we want. We want a happy, fulfilled future. And I think finally, you know, what, what sings across from everybody on this call is that we work really hard to make sure we put out the full smorgasbord of options, that, that we have staff that are trained to know there's option B, there's option C, there's option Z, and, and there's different pathways to each one. And I think, you know, I really have confidence in choosing organizations like ours because that is what we're making possible. And I think Thomas articulated it really well today. So thank you to him uh, as well as all the heads today from me. It's been great to be with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Michael. Um, thank you so much, Alistair. Thank you, Thomas. And we're wishing you all the best in your exams. I know you've got a couple more. I've got a son who's doing GCSEs, but he doesn't want to be a doctor. He wants to be a lawyer. Another pathway that we need to talk about. But anyway, um, <laughs> I think he should be a politician. But anyway, that's mum talking. Um, thank you, Mary. And thank you so much, Andrew. And I want to say to everybody, I really appreciate all of your time that you've taken away. I know this term looks like it's on the up. Let's pray that it continues that way because the in, out, in, out, shake it all about was beginning to get on my nerves. Um, but I, I, I just want to thank you all and I want to thank all the parents watching again. And if you need to reach out to any of these schools, please get in touch with us at the office at hello at everythingseducation.com and we will push you in the right direction. Every one of these schools is absolutely amazing and is definitely a pathway into medicine should it be the right route for your child. So without much ado, I want to say thank you to everybody on the panel and thank you to everybody for watching. I'm Elaine Cunningham-Walker from Everything's Education.